just likes my uh, my stats uh, application. Yes, I'm very I'm too uh, <laughs> superstitious. Yeah, I'll 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 refrain because I, I know Chris doesn't like it. So. Okay, yep. <laughs> Jetlin's saying I I did it right, so I'm allowed to start. Um, well, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, most of the folks on here, I I I know, which is. Uh, very great and a testament to all the hard work we've all done. Uh, if, if you're new or if you're watching live, uh, thank you. Uh, hopefully we can answer some of your, your burning questions uh, about Prop D, about Prop D, about Center for Election Science, about approval voting. We got it all. Uh, so I will, I will introduce myself. Uh, maybe you guys saw my introductory video today, uh, but that, that would... Uh, cover all the bases, but the short version is I am uh, Chris Raleigh, Director of Campaigns and Advocacy for the Center for Election Science, and I work on the campaigns. And we have one major campaign we're working on right now, which is the St. Louis campaign, uh, Prop D for Democracy. We have been helping them out for almost two years at this point. Uh, but I will also kick it over to the rest of the Center for Election Science. Um, oh, yeah, sorry, Rob. You can watch that later, uh, but I will let uh, the rest of our team introduce themselves. Aaron, you want to go first? So I'm uh, here in uh, Chicago, Illinois. Uh, as maybe you know, we're, uh, we really embrace the virtual nature of our organization. So we are all over. Um, uh, none of us in California, though. Uh, the uh, I started the organization in uh, 2011 uh, with a group of online uh, voting uh, geeks and uh, folks with uh, uh, math and uh, engineering backgrounds. Um, and we've made significant uh, progress since then. And we're very excited, uh, particularly with what's going on now in St. Louis. Hi everyone, my name is Caitlin Pena. I am the Director of Operations and Programs at the Center for Election Science. Um, I came on board um, about two, two and a half years ago um, when the Center for Election Science got its first dose of major funding and Aaron was able to go full time and hire me and another staff member. Um, so I've been here since we helped uh, on the campaign in Fargo, which became the first city in the US to use approval voting. And now I'm really excited to see if St. Louis becomes the second. Hello, I'm Andrea Denault. Um, I organized the campaign in Fargo after Jed Lemke um, led the initiative and had been working on approval voting for a couple of years. Um, uh, just recently got back in with um, the Center for Election Science and working now as their national campaigns and advocacy coordinator. That's a long title, I always forget. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I absolutely love what we're doing. I love election reform. My background is in human rights, primarily anti-racist work. And I do think that uh, plurality voting is an arm of white supremacy. And so uh, for me, this is an extension of the human rights work that I've been doing for years. So happy to be here and happy to be part of the team. Wonderful. Well, thank you, rest of CES team. I will, I am assuming, even though I have talked to most of you for a very long time, uh, we might as well go start at the basics. So I'm gonna give, uh, go over just a little primer with everybody just to make sure we're all on the same uh, same page. And for those of you on Facebook Live or all over the country, uh, you can follow along. You guys see it? Good? See the same? So welcome to the CES Town Hall. We are, of course, CES, the Center for Election Science. Uh, you have heard of uh, the people, but uh, you have maybe heard of the organization, but what is it? We are a national nonpartisan nonprofit organization. Uh, we work for the benefit of, of everyone. Well, not maybe not every organization that works in uh, electoral politics, uh, 
maybe has everyone's best interest in mind, we, we legitimately are here uh, to help as many people as possible. Uh, we have this one way of improving that system, uh, approval voting, which we love, which is Carlo voting, which, which is a type of voting. You're gonna learn way more about families of voting if you follow us than you've ever imagined. Uh, but approval voting is a quick and simple way to, to change our system. And as Aaron mentioned, we are a small team, uh, but we have been moving pretty fast. Aaron started the organization in 2011, right, Aaron? He's nodding. And, um, you know, it, it is uh, such a pleasure to work with so many people across the country already at this point. We have uh, six chapters. We recently just received seven RFP proposals for uh, potentially new places to bring uh, approval voting to where they live. So we're moving pretty fast. Um, and another big thing is where do we get our money? Oh, well, we get a lot of money from donors like you. Thank you very much if you are a donor. Um, but our, we have, uh, it's called concentrated funding, right? We, get, we have one big funder, which is the Open Philanthropy Project. Open Philanthropy Project is focused on long-term solutions to global problems. So pretty cool that they think that we are a long-term solution to global problems. Hopefully I got that right here. But um, other folks you may have heard of, Prop D for Democracy, uh, started by St. Louis folks. Uh, they saw that uh, in St. Louis, that people were getting elected with uh, less than, definitely less than 50% of the vote, but less than 40% of the vote, 35, 30% of the vote people were getting elected by in, uh, in the significant elections. Um, but it was grassroots. There's a couple of, of, of folks, one of which is a college student uh, who decided to uh, to do something about the broken elections in the city. And they, you know, and he felt that it was having an impact on how the city and the government were working. And they, they asked us for money and they won. They, they applied for a grant and they won. Uh, just how, like how we applied to the Open Philanthropy Project and won, so too did uh, Prop D for Democracy. They won because they uh, have great people on their team. Mallory's on their team uh, right now and hopefully uh, Benj and Tyler and Rasheen, who are uh, the steering committee of, of Prop D, uh, can join us or are watching at home. But um, they are all incredibly impressive people who will have long and illustrious careers after this campaign. Um, but really what has motivated us to, to support them and to work behind them um, is their passion. It's their passion for not only reform and trying to get things done, but trying to get things done quickly, right? St. Louis needs help today and we're happy to help. And approval voting was a good solution for them. We, we know that many people have heard mostly of ranked choice voting, right? That's okay, they've been around for a while. Approval voting in this case, despite it being good and we'll tell you why it's good, uh, just wouldn't work for their city. They couldn't do it, uh, it cost too much money. So. We're, we're happy to be that tool for, for communities to use in the future. Uh, so Prop D has three parts, and I'm just going to talk about two of them very quickly because they're a little bit of a no-brainer. So a nonpartisan primary, what does that mean? So in, in St. Louis, uh, Democrats have a primary, the Republicans have a primary, the Greens have a pr primary, the Libertarians have a primary, and all the other folks in the city have a primary just like how you would for president or governor to send their, uh, send their nominee to uh, the mayoral or city council election. If that sounds silly to you, you probably live in the 80% of cities that don't have that. <laughs> it's, it's one of those things that it's basically uh, across the country. As you can see on this map, all the green ones are nonpartisan elections uh, for for city elections and yellow is uh, partisan elections, like I mentioned. So folks don't, at the city level, partisanship matters just a little bit less. At least that's what a lot of people believe and that's why it is so prominent. Most places also have a top two system, right? The only way to kind of make sure you get 50% is to have it only be two people in the end, 
which a lot of states' constitutions um, and other laws say that they have to have more than 50%. So the only way to do that is to have 50%, or is to have a top two runoff, excuse me. Um, now, you may be saying to yourself, well, like, why does this matter? Why does this matter? And what is the problem in St. Louis? In St. Louis and in other cities, a lot of people run for a lot of different elections. People have all types of options, which is fantastic. They just have really crappy ways of saying the people that they like. Uh, the, and of the top 100 US cities, on average for, the, for an open seat for mayor, 7.8 candidates ran, right? And so what does that lead to? That leads to a problem called vote splitting, uh, which we will talk about in a little bit. But these two work super great with approval voting. Approval voting, like this picture says, you can vote for all the people that you like, all the candidates you like, the one with the most votes wins. In this case, it'd be the top two. So just like how uh, uh, Helen and Jim move on, they will also move on to the top two uh, in a runoff. Uh, it makes systems, you know, it's like it's like a good spice, right? You can you can technically cook without it, but there comes a point where it just makes everything better. Approval voting is very similar to that, where you just want to even want to do another election once you once you learn about approval voting. Uh, and and another big piece of this is how does it look? What did the final results look like? This is just a poll from that the Center for Election Science did in spring of this year around the Democratic uh, presidential nomination. We did Democrats because they're the ones who had a competitive race. In the blue, we asked people who, we, who they wanted to vote for, and we let them do it three ways. In the blue is the old way, plurality, pick one. You can see it's pretty split. It's almost evenly split between two, three candidates. Ranked choice is the red, you know, the ranked choice that you rank them and then you do a couple runoffs. And at the end, you have someone who gets over 50% if, if it works out. Uh, this is ranked choice in its best light, which after I think in this case was about 12 or 13 rounds, ended up with someone having 50%, over 50%. Green is approval voting. As you can see, people's true support for these candidates is seen, right? And uh, and if this was St. Louis, the top two in this situation would move on to the final round. Why do we do it? Because it's free. <laughs> that's a big that's a big help, right? Uh, you know, it doesn't cost a dime extra. That was one of the main selling points in St. Louis. Uh, and, and at CES, we deserve every city, every locality, every state, they deserve better elections regardless of any, you know, having gobs and gobs of money to pay for it. Uh, second is it's accessible. Everyone can understand it. You can, everyone can use it. Sometimes a, there's a lot of voting methods out there and they can get complicated fast, either complicated to do, complicated to, to understand. Um, you know, voters deserve, and it's important for democracy, for people to feel good about knowing how they voted and seeing that and the end results. Third is we can do it tomorrow. Uh, every machine in America basically can do approval voting uh, because every machine in America can do it, makes it free, and makes all of our elections possible to be improved tomorrow. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, it may be the case where some people live in some localities, but that's definitely not the case everywhere. So it's free and you can do it the next day. And it's democratic, right? Vote splitting is when you have maybe one or two people you like, or there are similar candidates and they steal votes from each other, like in that graph I showed earlier. Approved voting virtually gets rid of vote splitting. It's very hard. For vote splitting to happen because you can vote for everyone you like and the community wins because they get a winner that they they want that they like imagine that sounds kind of novel uh the home stretch people are interested in, in in voting a different way we did a poll last year in st louis 
and you know some traditional uh, groups that you know for one reason or another uh, don't vote at the at the same rate as maybe people with more education or or, or wider folks uh, traditionally unfortunately who, who vote more uh, who have a history of voting more uh, folks that have been either disenfranchised or or, or not as feel not as involved in the democratic process have really shown interest in, in uh, voting and approval voting. We don't know, there's a great question in political science, why people don't vote, why people don't turn out. And there's a thousand different theories, right? We're not saying that this will make people go vote, but it definitely seems like it makes people interested in voting. And it's not just a Democrat thing, it's not a Republican thing, it's not an independent thing. Across the board, you can see all the stats here. People are interested in using approval voting and how it may impact their willingness or their excitement to go vote. And good thing for St. Louis and everyone around the country, somebody's already tried it, Fargo. Uh, Andrea and her, her gang have, have gotten it in Fargo and they had the first ever approval voting election this summer. Uh, we did another poll and people liked it. Uh, 60, uh, not on here, but 62% of people liked it. 71% of people said it was easy. So that means 9% of people who didn't like it still thought it was easy, which is my favorite stat. 69% of people said they could vote for their favorite, right? That's vote splitting. That's vote splitting. That's people seeing immediately in the first election that vote splitting can get taken care of with approval voting. And good thing for Fargo, same machines, no big updates, same, basically same ballot, same piece of paper. I just said vote for one or more. Uh, the biggest thing, and these are the last two, the biggest thing for people to get past is, is their mindset, right? We've already, we've always done it this way. This is always how we do it. Or I like the candidates that I have. That's not the point. The point is your vote is something that's scarce. Right, it's scarce because it's scarce. You know, there's only one. There's only, you know, uh, there's only so many about there. So what do people do? They tear each other apart <laughs> to make sure that they get, you know, uh, enough votes for them to win. And then once they get 20, 30 percent of the vote, they stop. Right? They stop. They they treat you differently because you only have one vote, or they know they already have your vote. Right, you only have one vote, so you are the the least powerful in this situation. You know, you you won't vote for a candidate because you're worried about splitting your vote, and so what happens? People don't run, or they 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 run or they don't get traction, or they get told, you know, I need someone who who can beat such and such, uh, and it's hard for us to see past this because this is all we've ever done. You know, we're trying to change that in this situation. You know, we want to make sure people understand your opinion should not be limited for basically any reason. This is the government telling you your your opinion should be limited to one, despite the number of options you have. If you have more power, if you have more votes, campaigns and governments, as someone who used to work on campaigns, I'll tell you, people will treat you differently. People won't skip you. People won't assume that uh, that you're only for them. And then it, it makes more ideas possible, lets you support more ideas. As you saw in the example uh, of the Democratic poll, uh, there was a lot of support for maybe folks who got very low uh, support in the polls. Now, were they going to win? No. But they showed that people like their ideas, and that's really important. And finally, something that's really important to us, to have leaders, God forbid, that thought like us. <laughs> that were more in line with the values of most people that wanted to do something for the most amount of people possible. That's why we like approved voting. So what can you do? Start your own chapter, volunteer with us or Prop D, uh, donate to either organization. Both will be very excited for that. Uh, join the CES community on our Discord, which is like a, a messaging a message board. Uh, spread the word to your friends and, and get our email updates. And with that, I think you are fully primed 
on approval voting and, and the like. And uh, please, uh, for the rest of, of, of our little presentation, uh, put your questions in the chat and we'll make sure we get to you. Caitlin, do we have any ones to start off with? No questions yet. Um, oh, uh, Rob, Rob just stuck one in there. He says, one question for anyone who wants to answer it. How much have y'all heard about ranked choice voting when talking to voters in St. Louis? Well, I have only done so much, but I would uh, uh, I'd be eager maybe in a little bit to hear from any of our St. Louis folks. Uh, just Rob to say in general, it's not St. Louis, but basically when I talk to anyone I've ever met <laughs> or met in a situation where I'm trying to like table or something, we know that the number one thing people have heard of is ranked choice voting, it comes up a lot. Now I, in St. Louis and I'm, I'll speak a little bit for Mallory and them because she's not working tonight, we are. Uh, that some folks have, uh, some folks conflate ranked choice voting and approval voting. Uh, some do it on purpose. <laughs> some people legitimately have a hard time figuring out the difference. Um, just like how I mentioned our, our minds right now are kind of in a scarcity world. Right? There's not a lot of room in people's thoughts for more than one voting method, let alone two, let alone three, let alone four, let alone, you know, how many else we have. Um, but hopefully I, I did enough for Mallory that she feels that she doesn't have to chime in today. You can give me a thumbs up. Uh, maybe I could say something too. I'm, I'm Kathleen Farrell and I'm, I don't have an official title. I'm with the League of Women Voters. We got very much involved in this. Uh, but I think that um, every place has to look at their individual situation. And one of the things that we looked at here was, first of all, very practically, we don't have voting machines that can deal with ranked choice voting. It doesn't look like we're gonna have them forever. That's the first practical thing. The second thing is like Fargo, you may think St. Louis is large, um, but it isn't. It, inside, we have very tight boundaries. We had white flight out and we have a, about 320,000 people inside the city limits. Jeff just asked, what's the difference between St. Louis and St. Louis County? Uh, St. Louis is a very peculiar place in many ways, and one of the ways it's peculiar is that it is both a city and a county. So it is St. Louis City County, and then outside of it, particularly to the west and south and north, is St. Louis County. Uh, if you put the two together, we've got about, Mallory, two plus million people in that area. Um, but we're, we're very different. And there's been lots of discussions about joining the two. I don't see that happening, but uh, I digress. When you have a smaller city like that, and I grew up in Chicago, you know, which is a big place, and Fargo is a, a Midland sized city. It's much easier, I think, to get name recognition to run for office. Um, you can get your message out there. And I think that uh, having uh, approval voting also fits that situation. It really is possible for a new candidate to run um, in that first race, in that primary race and get their ideas out there. It's possible. You can drive from one end of the city to the other in 20 minutes. And I think also very practically, uh, you need to look at every situation, but I, those are two factors that I think are important, at least for me. No other questions yet in the chat. Um, if anybody does have questions, Tony, Joe, Michael, Rob, any of you have questions, uh, Jeff? Feel free to 
let us know, stick them in the chat. Um, since it is such a small group here, we could probably even let some of you unmute if, if you feel more comfortable just sharing, um, sharing out loud. Oh, we did get a big question from, from Michael just now. Um, let's see. Okay, so Michael is talking, it sounds like about um, a previous, uh, some, some of our, our polling from 2016, from the 2016 election. So this might be a question for Aaron. Um, I, I'll just read it aloud. Uh, in, in case there are folks listening on Facebook. So the question is um, asking about a polling that we did in the 2016 general election. Um, the top two in that polling were Hillary and Bernie, Trump was number three. Um, and so Michael says, then today you show a simulation of the 2020 Democratic prim Party primary where the top two were Warren and Bernie. I think this is a problem on two levels. One, the pitch seems to cater exclusively to left-wingers. Two, a primary election typically has less than a third of the turnout of the general. So isn't it problematic to eliminate candidates like Trump or Biden in the first round like that? Wouldn't it be better to find one candidate and then find the second one from ballots that didn't approve the first candidate? So Aaron, I don't know if you have a response here. Sure. Uh, so I think one of the uh, things that uh, Michael was looking at is the proposition that's in front of St. Louis, and then also uh, thinking about, okay, well, what about presidential elections? What if we did presidential elections this way? One of the things to think about with approval voting is that its simplicity really lends itself to um, a, a number of different contexts. So in the state of Missouri, you have to have uh, they they interpret majority in the uh, sorry in, in the general election you're required to use a choose one system, and so just by the parameters of what we're dealt with in the state of Missouri uh, and and working with the folks in, in St. Louis uh, had to use a system that used approval voting during the primary process and then using a, a, a top two system in the general election. Now that's not to say that. In every context, approval voting has to be implemented this way. Uh, you can do it in a variety of different contexts. So for instance, at the state level, you could have closed primaries and everyone in their closed primary using approval voting. And then in the general election, have approval voting again with all the parties nominees in addition to independents. And you can do that. And part of the reason you can do that is because approval voting is very simple and it allows it to be flexible at the same time. In terms of the examples that uh, we had, for instance, in the 2016 election and the um, uh, 2020 election in the primary, uh, there was some concern over that being maybe more tailored to liberals. The, the thing is like, this is just the way the data rolls out. Like we don't like, like we, we don't control the data in any, in any way. We set up the design and we make it as fair as possible. And this is just the way the, the data comes out. So in 2016, we had a design and um, uh, Caitlin, feel free to throw the um, uh, article uh, from the 2016 election in there. The, we had a design that used um, uh, within subjects in terms of each respondent being able to respond under each different voting method. And then we had another uh, component, which is between subjects, which meant that half of the respondents of the 2000 respondents, so 1000 had a short list, which was um, Clinton, Trump, uh, um, uh, Johnson, and Stein, and then a long list that included um, those four plus uh, some other nominees, including uh, uh, Sanders, Cruz, uh, Bloomberg, and some others. And in that longer list, uh, Sanders did uh, well there. He, uh, uh, tied with uh, Clinton in that in that uh, uh, experiment under approval voting, and the it just happened to come out that way. Um, and with the uh, Democratic uh, um, primary, uh, the same thing. We we used a very similar design. Uh, there was a within subject design where we had each respondent uh, respond under different voting methods, and then we had a control measure on top of that. 
And uh, there in the earlier part of the year, uh, in around November, uh, Warren did a little bit better under approval voting with Sanders in second. And then uh, a little bit later, uh, in the earlier part of the 2020 year, uh, Sanders looked a little bit better under approval voting um, with uh, Warren in, in second. And we also have a good idea that this was a good, that approval voting actually did a good job measuring candidate support because we also had a control measure and approval voting did a good job mirroring that control measure. So we, we really painstakingly look at these designs when we set them up and try to make them as fair as possible. Also, the idea of a control measure was a novel instrument that we included. Uh, so we're also really on the cutting edge in terms of research methodology with these approaches. But uh, again, we try to be as fair as possible when we do these. And when we're looking at different types of setups, it's part of what we're doing is we're working within the parameters that we have in front of us. So Michael says he's not accusing us of being left-wingers, but he says we might be creating an impression that this is a plan that helps left-wingers and potentially turning off right-wingers. Um, and I, I, I think part of the issue there, Michael, as um, Chris noted in the comments, is that you know this year, the, the, the competitive race with lots of vote splitting was in the Democratic primary, right? Just because there's simply, that's, that's where there was a primary with lots of people to follow. Um, if there had been a Republican primary this year, we would have polled on the Republican primary. So um, it's, I, I completely, I hear your, your concern there, um, but it's, it's kind of about where, where are the interesting elections where we can really see these, the vote splitting taking place. It, and and uh, unfortunately, we only had funding, and we had to, at the time, we didn't have very much funding, and so we actually had to crowdfund to get the funds to do the poll in 2016. Ideally, if we had the funding available, we would have done the Republican primary. All of us love data and, and really uh, sharing it and being able to analyze it. So um, yeah, yeah, we would, uh, we, we, we love to take in data and look at uh, the way these different voting methods shake out at really every opportunity that we can. It just happens that these have been the opportunities in front of us so far. So one question in the chat that said, uh, what do we want to do next? What's the goal next? Which is a, it's a great question. I think that was Joe. Uh, Joe, we have just, we have just uh, closed our first ever round of uh, asking the public essentially for proposals uh, to ask us for, for money <laughs> or to, you know, to bring approval money where they live. Uh, we have gotten seven proposals, seven great proposals uh, from all over the United States. Some folks from our chapter program, which chapters are just kind of, you know, where people come in and they, uh, we meet on Zoom and we kind of talk about, uh, you know, how we could work on approved voting in, in different states and different cities. Um, and it's totally grassroots led. We just offer the, the room, right? Uh, um, and so there are, uh, first off, and I, I will be very remiss as a campaign person, but I did not say, um, best, like, we are really hoping that St. Louis wins on, on Tuesday and that we all know on Tuesday and, and this all might be a much shorter ride than we imagined <laughs> if, 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 if it's not. So, um, you know, we are cautiously optimistic about, uh, St. Louis on Tuesday, Mallory, Kathleen, the rest of the coalition have done an amazing job, an amazing job building such a great coalition of folks. And, uh, you know, they're, Mallory's probably working right now. That's probably why her, you know, she's not on the chat, but that's good. You know, she's, she's got quite the, the sprint left. Um, so, but yeah, we're, we're hoping that if people are interested in, in doing it where they live or in their state, uh, you know, if the laws are willing, we, we mostly try to work with ballot measures, right? As we see in St. Louis, politicians are not super excited about changing the way they got elected. Uh, I think somebody the other day said it wasn't fair. Well, they, they work for the people. And it, uh, sometimes the people 
have to get out there and demand the change. And that's, you, that's a good way of doing it with a ballot measure. Um, but we have extensive resources. Uh, we are developing kind of a legal-ish research net, network to help folks look into the local and state laws. Um, and that's my job. That's Caitlin's job. That's Aaron's job. We're to, we're, we are a tool. We are resources to help folks who want to bring it to where they live. So um, if, if that's what you're interested in, please uh, follow us. Uh, join our Discord and, and get involved. Any other questions from folks? We did just such a good job. We went speechless. I think you answered all the questions in the presentation, Chris. That's what I'm saying. Knocked it off ahead of time. Well, you know, if, if that's the case, short and sweet, I really appreciate everyone coming out. We will drop our, our website and uh, the, the way to reach out to us in the chat. Feel free to ask us anything. Uh, that's why we're here. That's why we did this today. We wanted to show you guys that. Um, who we got we a volunteer question. Oh. From Joe. Oh, okay. So Joe wants to know there are different types of volunteering. Can I talk about which kind? Uh, well, we have uh, uh, Joe. We actually have a, a a lot of volunteers, and we are we are trying to uh, get more people involved. Uh, there's only four of us. We had five. Uh, tomorrow we'll have four. <laughs> one uh, one of our folks is leaving. Uh, tomorrow. Uh, but we are looking for volunteers to help with campaigns to help, uh, you know, get the word out to if you have any sort of expertise like legal expertise, or even media, uh, like marketing expertise, we have one volunteer, shout out, uh, he may be watching, uh, who helps, who, who helps Mallory and their campaign, uh, you know, with their digital ads and, and, and uh, all kinds of great stuff like that. So we're really looking for people with skills. Um, we're really looking for people to, who want to get involved. The best way uh, to get involved right now is we have uh, a couple programs called uh, Volunteer Project Lead, Volunteer, Project, uh, volunteer or Organizer, and Room Captain. Uh, volunteer Project Lead, they are, we really lean on them to do like kind of heavier lifting research projects. Um, a lot of people like that. Uh, volunteer organizers, their job is to help us, well, organize, you know, shake some trees uh, to, help, to work with Andrew and I on, on that. Um, and the last is uh, room captain. So we have uh, our chapter meetings every two months. We'll have one in November. Uh, there's all, we have, many more chapters than we could actually, and we, we do them all at the same time, kind of help our, save our time. Um, and so we, we train folks to have conversations with all the cities and states and stuff that we can't be in, which is a really cool problem that we have, is that there's way too many folks for us to all talk to them. So uh, if that's something you're interested in, please check it out and, and sign up. And the other thing I wanna point out uh, is we have a, a sign up form on our website to start a chapter. So all that means is I'm interested in doing something. That's all it means. It doesn't mean I'm selling you my firstborn. It just means uh, I, I wanna get involved. I wanna get people in the room. Uh, we, have, we have really great data. We have a really great network of folks. I was telling someone uh, in a Midwest state, how many people, you know, 140 people uh, that were CES supporters lived within 20 miles of his house and didn't even know. Uh, that's what's kind of cool about proof voting uh, is that if you want to start something, there'll be plenty of people to help you. We also had a question that did come in on Facebook from Scott. He asked, do you guys think it makes sense to go directly to the large voices in each major party? I think he's referring to you know, getting their support 
um, in order to help uh, advance approval voting. I can speak to that from experience a little bit. Um, I think this happened both in Fargo and in St. Louis. Um, we reached out to party leaders um, in all of the major parties, you know, even major third parties. For the most part, they um, were reluctant to um, endorse approval voting. Um, we had a couple of people, for instance, in Fargo, there's a Senator, Kathy Hogan, um, very beloved by everyone in the state. Um, but she was an early supporter. And even while she was running her own campaign for Senate, was also out collecting signatures for us in Fargo, which was great. Um, but in terms of getting like official party endorsements, they've been near impossible so far. It's not to say that it won't work in the future. Um, but I think um, based on some of the feedback I've gotten from talking to elected officials, um, they, they are reluctant to get behind it because uh, quite frankly, I think a lot of them are worried about how it might essentially threaten their power and their ability to um, manipulate is a strong word, but uh, uh, it, it, it might threaten their ability to um, campaign in, in the way that they are used to. Um, I will say that, uh, you know, Fargo City Commission races are nonpartisan. However, um, all of the candidates who run, you know, definitely have their um, political orientation that's fairly well known. And one of the former commissioners um, in an interview that I did with him during the campaign told me that um, he and all of his colleagues who shared that same political orientation um, and were thinking about running would get together and decide amongst themselves, okay, who are we gonna run um, so, that, so that we don't split the vote and so that you know, it will give us a greater chance of, of winning um, or you know, ha having our political orientation on the commission. Um, which, you know, strategically is smart for them to do that. Uh, but, you know, the argument that we made in Fargo, um, and I think just from a citizen's perspective is that we want a variety of choices and we don't want a handful or five or six people to be deciding amongst themselves who to run. Um, if someone has, you know, the gumption, the stamina, and the ideas, and they want to run for office, I want them to run for office, and I want to maintain my choices. Um, so yeah, historically speaking, it's been difficult to get um, elected officials and party leaders to endorse it. It isn't to say that they're all against it. Um, but so far, that hasn't been shown to be a, a great strategy. Yeah, and, and Scott put a couple of um, additional comments in, uh, in the chat on, on Facebook, and it sounds like he's actually referring more to, should we go to the parties and say, hey, you should use this for your party primaries, right, so that you have less vote splitting, um, and so Absolutely. would it make more sense to like go and get it implemented in those primaries rather than going city to city to city. Um, and he's talking about, you know, the national level. So for Andrew Yang or Pete Buttigieg, like we saw in, in that poll that Chris put up there that, you know, Andrew Yang probably wasn't going to be the winner, even under approval voting, but he was able to see how much more support he actually had, right? Um, or, you know, same with Pete Buttigieg or any of the other candidates, they could get a much more accurate reflection of that support. And in some cases, it, it is possible that it would change the outcome because there aren't similar candidates vying for the same piece of the pie. And I know that Aaron Hamlin makes this argument all the time, but primaries themselves are actually the, the prime, um, like, they're the, the perfect application for something like 
approval voting specifically because um, you know the problem that approval voting addresses is vote splitting amongst similar candidates um, who share um, overlapping platforms. They share a similar base, um, and you know if if you have this like hyper partisan race, you know like nationally right now we've got Donald Trump and uh, Joe Biden. They're really probably not like stealing votes from each other, or you know Joe Jorgensen. Um, but when you've got a large body of candidates who are, are really similar in a lot of different ways, that's where vote splitting happens the most. Um, and so, yeah, primaries are an ideal um, scenario for approval voting to uh, improve uh, improve democracy and making sure that you know when it does get to the point where we are at a general election, we know that the people who who won their primary did so with broad support. Hey, there's one question here uh, from Michael. He, he, less of a question, more of a comment about how, and uh, it's good because I've, you know, we've heard this about the money involved, right? Okay. It's much easier to 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 uh, spend on a smaller group than it is to, to get on a bigger group. Uh, Michael, I got in the back of my mind. I think that in 2018, the average congressional uh, race spent fifty dollars per voter, right? Whereas in a major city for a major metro, uh, for mayor of Houston, they spent. It was, a, it was a big controversy because they spent one, it was between one and $3 per person, right? The money here in general in the system is crazy, right? Um, one thing, you know, I, people argue that, well, it's gonna cost me more money. I think, again, keeping your mind, those are people who don't want to talk to more people, right? And when you work on a campaign like I have, your goal is to, to, to narrow it down to the smallest group of people possible. But I think we also need to work past that mindset of, you know, everything's gonna stay the way it is, we're just gonna be able to vote for more people, right? I think one thing that we, we hope that happens is people with more exciting ideas get out there, people who, uh, who motivate more people to work on their campaign, get out there, right? There's, uh, and I and I'll only use Seattle as an as a example, because I see Deb here, but, um, but it's also a good example that they have a type of publicly funded election, right? They, now that's not necessarily what we're working on, um, but Seattle has publicly funded elections. Uh, they have a nonpartisan top two primary they just had 20 people run, right? They brought so many people to the table. It worked. They got more options. They got more people to run. They just have a crappy way of counting counting people's support. And, and I think the mayor still got like 30, 30 ish percent of uh, support. So uh, now people say that gets all worked out in the runoff, but um, I've worked on a lot of primaries and largely the money goes to people who are seen as viable right and a huge part of viability is uh, of not being viable right is that is vote splitting we already have uh, a successful candidate we don't need two or three right you're depriving the voters um and and they're not able to give they're not able to attract resources because they're not seen as viable. But at, at the end of the day, if again, just to use the presidential primaries as, as an example, there were a lot of people who cared a lot about some of the other candidates that got 2%, 4% of the vote, right? And they were able to fundraise. Now it's a, a national election. But them just even being able to show the support for their ideas is incredibly important. And you bet, you bet. The next time around, people see, oh, I can get 30% of the vote, 40% of the vote, or 40% approval by tapping into this person and their ideas. You know, 
I, I more ideas, bolder ideas. I think will will get bubble up to the top. Um, and again, we the whole system is going to be hopefully reimagined on the money front soon. But um, I don't think it's totally fair to compare right now to it. Maybe in the future, uh, but we'll see. Hopefully, it's more vigorous debate, and that will really kind of uh, bring some attention. Okay, we have one. Uh, I'll I'll give this one to Aaron. It's about ranked choice voting, and so, so first off, okay. uh, the only thing I'll say is we will, we are not going to say, you know, our position. <laughs> we want people to make up their own their own mind, um, and 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 we mean it. Uh, we the status quo is awful, we'll put it like that, but um, the status quo is awful everywhere. Uh, if, it, if, if it wins and the people of Massachusetts want it, great for the people of Massachusetts. If the people of Massachusetts don't want it, you know, we gotta start all over again, but, but people deserve something better. Um, one question, and I'll, I'll put it like this, only because we get it a lot, is why would a, why would a place pick approval voting over ranked choice voting? And I'll let Aaron kind of do that one. Uh, sure. So it looks like um, so the, the question uh, is about Massachusetts. What happens there? And I think either way, in terms of how it shakes out, um, we keep going uh, according to our game plan. Uh, which is working with communities all across the country and making sure that they are aware of the options in front of them and giving them the tools and resources uh, that they need uh, should they decide that approval voting is the tool that works for them and their community. So I think regardless of what happens in Massachusetts, Mass the people of, of Massachusetts are going to decide what works for them with their ballot initiative. Uh, but there are a number of communities th uh, throughout the rest of the country that had that question before them still. And uh, again, like that game plan doesn't change regardless of what happens to Massachusetts. Um, this is David. So let me, let me just comment on that. Uh, the group Voter Choice Massachusetts, which I consider to be, you know, not legally, but in effect, a subsidiary of Fair Vote. Um, uh, has raised about six million dollars and is doing um, a publicity campaign with flyers in the mail and on the web and a lot of ads. And there is a um, group uh, in opposition to that that's raised two hundred dollars. And so the public, you know, hears like nobody much uh, talking about other systems or you know the possible negative consequences of RCV and a $6 million campaign in favor of it. So assuming it passes, I don't think that that necessarily means that the voters understood enough to decide what they were voting for. They hear a group talking about all the problems of plurality voting and those problems are real and they're presented with one solution as if that were the only solution. Yeah, and I, I can I can understand the concern that that you're raising there, uh, David. And the um, from like from our standpoint, they're deciding between this awful choose one method and ranked choice voting. Uh, and for us, uh, we recognize how hard it is to to move forward. And also, it's important that uh, data points uh, be out there as well, so that we can learn. Uh, more uh, about uh, these election reforms as they're implemented throughout the country. We, we know that really anything is better than the choose one method that we have now. Obviously, uh, we uh, strongly prefer approval voting over uh, ranked choice voting, but at the same time, um, uh, we, we wanna see people move away from uh, priority voting or choose one system. And so uh, when that's an option for folks, uh, we're going to uh, leave it to them to, to make that decision. And for the people who are making up the decision of, OK, do we use priority voting or, or something else? So for folks who aren't yet 
at this stage where the, where they have an initiative in front of them for a, uh, for another voting method, um, or they're they're looking at approval voting as, as an option. Those are really the folks that we're looking to in terms of making sure that they recognize what their what their options are uh, and being able to work for them after they come to the conclusion of what works best for them. Thank you. Andrew, did you want to talk about your uh, the experience of, of Fargo in that case? Um, yeah, kind of both Fargo and you know why why approval voting over ranked choice voting. So um, I I will start by talking about how I got involved in approval voting to begin with. I, I was living in Bismarck, North Dakota. No one knows where that is, but it's three hours away from Fargo, um, and uh, this was in 2017, I think. Um, I just saw a random Facebook event uh, happening in Fargo talking about some lecture was happening on voting methods. And at that period of time, I was like very upset about um, voting methods. And I was convinced that we all needed to adopt ranked choice voting. And so I thought that I was probably going to a lecture where I would be learning about ranked choice voting. And when I drove the three hours through the snow and ice to come listen to this lecture that I was so excited about, I was like, oh, approval voting, what's that? <laughs> um, but the only reason I bring that up is because um, I, like for ranked choice voting people, like I'm your people, you're my people. Uh, I, you know, for me, it just, um, I had to, it took a, a, a certain amount of like resolve to understand thoroughly how both methods work. Um, as far as Fargo is concerned, you know, we sort of had this like cheeky rebuttal to people who would ask us like, why aren't you pushing for ranked choice voting? And, you know, Jed would always say, well, if you really want ranked choice voting, you can start your own ballot initiative and go collect your own signatures and you could get ranked choice voting on the ballot. Uh, so that was, you know, for at that time, that was, you know, the easy answer to that question. Um, but now that we're expanding in all these different cities, this very valid question is coming up uh, constantly. Um, and, you know, in the case of Denver, who is in the process of forming a chapter right now, um, Denver is looking at the possibility of adopting either one of those two. So um, I've been involved in a lot more discussions recently about um, the differences between the two. And I just think it's really important for people who um, have, you know, have yet to be convinced that approved voting is better. Um, I just want anyone out there to understand uh, that ranked choice voting really just doesn't work the way that most people assume it works when they first hear about it, because intuitively it obviously sounds better to be able to rank your order of preference because we all have these preferences um, rather than, you know, just the simple like yes or no on each candidate, like ranking sounds more specific, more expressive. Um, and I get that. I think uh, the part that I didn't understand and the part that most people don't understand is the math involved, the actual tabulation mechanics. Um, and once you learn how convoluted and flawed it actually is, um, approval voting just makes so much more sense. Uh, but like I said, it does take uh, a, a bit of resolve and determination to actually like educate yourself on on how those two are different if you are you know genuinely interested in uh, being able to discern the two. And we, we did get a question. Oh, it, it looks like Kathleen. Um, I do you mean um, you want to speak to Jason's question? Uh, just very quickly. Uh, I discovered an analogy that has worked extremely well for the last month or so. And that is uh, for those of yeah, everybody has uh, experience in the workplace when you're hiring. And in academia, you know, which is the world I come from, you do it all the time. You know, you put out a call for a job, 
that's an elected official's post. You get a bunch of people who are interested in it. And you make two decisions. The first one is, okay, who's hireable? Who would I, you know, who do I think would be okay to hire? And to me, that's the first step of approval voting. Okay. And that means I can vote for everyone I think is hireable. And I have a lot of power there because then when I get in a runoff, I have a real choice. And those candidates uh, can be explored better. And they'll reach out, you know, uh, and explain why they would be the best choice. And to me, that makes great common sense. Uh, and it's the way that a lot of organizations do it. It's the way that, you know, I, I just think it's a good way to explain it. And that's, for me, why ranked choice does just doesn't cut it. It doesn't deal with those two commonsensical, reasonable processes that people choose people. And it forces them, approval voting, if it works, right, and people will do a lot more to reach out to people, really makes folks and political parties, by the way, and groups that they are trying to appeal to say, okay, is this person hireable? And then, you know, uh, and then you, you choose the best candidate. So I thought I would just offer that sort of persuasive tactic that I've come up with lately. Yeah, I think that's a great analogy, Kathleen. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and uh, th this is kind of, uh, this question, I think most of us on the call know the answer to, um, but there's a question on Facebook from Jason and he asked, did somebody describe the difference between approval and preferential ballots? Is preferential different than rank choice? And this is a question um, that there, Aaron always likes to note that uh, the voting methods field is really bad at naming things. And there's like a million different names for every type of voting method. And when it comes to rank choice voting, instant runoff voting, preferential voting, the alternative vote, there's lots of ways to describe it. And it gets confusing because there are multiple methods that include ranking that are not what people currently referred to as ranked choice voting. Erin, um, I don't know if you have a, a specific answer that you'd like to give to this. Is preferential different than ranked choice? Uh, sure. So I think uh, in terms of terminology, they're uh, synonymous uh, with each other. Uh, but when we talk about a preferential ballot, uh, so voting methods are uh, can be sometimes a bit overwhelming, uh, particularly uh, if you're just kind of newly being introduced, introduced to them. The way that I conceptualize voting methods just to keep it straight in my head uh, is I think about single winner methods. And then I have another branch over here where I see multi-winner methods. Um, and then to keep it simple, I'll just talk about the single winner methods part. Uh, you've got uh, plurality voting, which is doesn't quite necessarily fit neatly into any particular category. Um, then you've got uh, cardinal methods that involve some kind of uh, rating uh, setup or scoring setup. Uh, you have methods like range voting, approval voting in there. And then you have uh, ranking methods also called ordinal systems. Uh, there you've got a whole bunch of them. You've got uh, incident runoff voting, also known as all these other names, ranked choice voting, uh, preferential voting, Hera method all these other names, but then you've got all these other ranking methods like uh, board account, Condorcet methods, uh, Buckland methods. And, and so that it's named ranked choice voting is definitely confusing. Um, I, didn't, I didn't name it, none, none of us uh, named it, uh, but uh, as a consequence, it does make it a bit more confusing. But it's important to note that the way that terminology is used, particularly in the US, it's referring to incident runoff voting. Um, and there are very big differences between incident runoff voting and approval voting. One, like as we see right from the beginning, the type of information you're putting on the ballot is very different. With, with the incident runoff voting, you've got 
rankings that you're doing with the candidates. So you're using technically called ordinal information. Uh, and then for approval voting, you're selecting as uh, many as you want, kind of like a thumbs up or thumbs down, where you're just simply uh, totaling them. Um, and so uh, very different methods uh, overall, uh, but absolutely you are appropriately confused by the name. So, so don't, don't feel remotely bad about that. All right, well, I don't think there are any other questions currently in the chat that I'm seeing. Um, and we're actually about 15 minutes over the time that we had originally allotted here. Um, but thank you everyone for attending. Thank you for to the few folks who, who have tuned in on Facebook and contributed questions there as well. Um, I know that we really appreciate you guys coming out and um, participating, asking questions and lending your support. Um, we will definitely um, keep you updated on what goes on in St. Louis on Tuesday. Um, as Chris is putting in the chat, definitely visit uh, electionscience.org if you'd like to learn more. And you can email Chris if you want to know more about campaigns, about um, chapters, the RFP process that we just uh, started for the first time and we plan to have um, biannually starting, starting next year. Um, you can email Chris at chris at electionscience.org. But thank you, everyone. I hope you all have a great night and um, happy voting if you haven't voted yet. See ya. Thank you, everyone. Godspeed in St. Louis. <laughs>